Imagine traveling in a foreign country when you learn the news of your father's death. Now imagine that that death means you are now at the helm of the British Empire. This is how Queen Elizabeth II discovered that she would no longer be a princess, but instead would be the queen of the most powerful empire in history. She was only 25 years old and would soon become the head of one of the world's most powerful monarchies, a post she would hold for much of the 20th century. Elizabeth wasn't even supposed to be queen, but as the old saying goes, when humans plan, God laughs. Elizabeth was born on April the 21st, 1926, to the Duke and Duchess of York. Her father, Prince Albert, was at that time the second in line to the monarchy, following the current king, George V, and his older brother, Edward, Prince of Wales. And should her parents, or Prince Albert, have had a son, the male heirs would jump ahead of Elizabeth in the line of succession. It was Elizabeth's uncle, Edward, the Prince of Wales, whose behavior altered this line of succession. In love with an American divorcee, Edward abdicated the throne in 1936 amid a public uproar about his love life. Elizabeth's father became King George VI, and Elizabeth became the next in line to the throne at the age of just 10. Reportedly, Elizabeth's younger sister Margaret told her, poor you, upon learning the news of the new line of succession. Now, before the family was thrust into the role of monarchs, Elizabeth, Margaret, and their parents lived a relatively quiet life split between homes in London and the countryside. Elizabeth was educated at home by a governess. She wasn't around children her own age, with the exception of her sister, which was a somewhat lonely experience that she tried to avoid for her own children. During these lessons, Elizabeth enjoyed learning about history and also showed herself to be a responsible and organized child. She even insisted on properly setting up her toy horses before bed each night, making sure that each was unsaddled and fed. As intelligent and responsible as she showed herself to be, Elizabeth still showed herself to be, like many other children, in one regard. And that was that she had trouble pronouncing her own name. Instead of Elizabeth, she said Lilibet. As a result, the nickname stuck, and it was what her close family would come to know her as. As Elizabeth grew older and became next in line to the throne, more emphasis was placed on formal education. As a 12-year-old, she was taught constitutional history from a member of Eton's faculty, and the the Archbishop of Canterbury was her religious instructor. It wasn't exactly what you'd call a typical education. But it wasn't all dry scholastic studies. Being the daughter of the king certainly did have its perks. To help Elizabeth's social reach and outdoors education, a Buckingham Palace chapter of the Girl Guides was started. Each Wednesday afternoon, 20 fortunate girls were welcome to the palace to take part in outdoors-orientated activities and be part of the future queen's social circle. But alas, the comfortable, innocent childhood of Elizabeth, it was not to last. Coming of age in the 1930s, her life would be affected by World War II before she turned 15. By 1939, England was at war, and though pressure mounted to send Elizabeth and Margaret to Canada, their mother would hear of no such thing. Instead, they were sent to live at Windsor Castle in 1940. This it served two purposes, keeping Elizabeth and Margaret safer than they might otherwise be in London, but also helping helping to show the strength of the country in a time of terrible upheaval and fear. If England was safe enough for the princesses, then it was safe enough for the rest of the country too, and Brits should be proud and patriotic to do their duty for the war, just like the young princesses were doing. Now, while the royal sisters were staying in a castle and were closely watched over, that does not mean the princesses were completely exempt from all the fears and uncertainty that comes with war. While they were staying at Windsor Castle, hundreds of bombs were dropped in the area, and like so many of their countrymen, Elizabeth and Margaret were roused from bed in the middle of the night, rushed to bomb shelters, and kept on constant alert for the air raid siren. In October of 1940, at the age of 14, Elizabeth gave a radio address that was heard throughout England and North America. She discussed the situation that she and Margaret were in, talking about how they understood what their evacuated peers were feeling. They talked about being separated from their loved ones, and 
living in a world turned upside down by violence. But Elizabeth, she wanted to do more for her country than just speak on the radio. She was not yet 18 though, and it wasn't until near the end of the war that she was given the opportunity to serve as a trainee ambulance driver. She learned about car repair, and photos of her working became iconic images of the British war effort. On VE Day, she wore her uniform and stood on the balcony with Prime Minister Churchill and her parents. Elizabeth, she was not yet queen, but even as a teenager, she had shown herself to be quite the leader. So the war ended in 1945, but its aftermath remains, even for royalty. When Elizabeth married two years after the end of the war, she purchased the fabric for her wedding gown using ration coupons. But that didn't mean her dress was a dreary affair. It was made of silk and decorated with over 10,000 pearls. Her groom, well, that was Prince Philip of Greece, a man who'd been in and out of Elizabeth's life since she was 13 years old. As second cousins, they saw each other at family functions throughout their lives. Teenage Elizabeth she'd been intrigued by Philip since meeting him in her early teens, but it was when Elizabeth was 17 and he was 22 that the prince began to consider marrying her. Now, as we did mention, they were second cousins, but such a marriage between cousins is hardly unusual for royalty. Philip was born in Greece and was a member of the line of succession to the Greek throne. However, he gave up his position in the line of succession to become a naturalized British citizen. The night before their wedding, he was made the Duke of Edinburgh. The two, they announced their engagement in July of 1947, celebrating the happy occasion with a garden party. In photos from the party, Elizabeth is unabashedly excited, while Prince Philip gazes down at her adoringly. Only four months later, in November of 1947, the two were married in a ceremony at Westminster Abbey. The Archbishops of Canterbury and York performed the rite with royalty around the world in attendance. 200 million commoners were able to listen in via a BBC radio broadcast. After the ceremony, Elizabeth and Philip, with Elizabeth still wearing wearing her wedding gown, waved to cheering crowds from the balcony of Buckingham Palace. Shortly after, Elizabeth gave birth to their first child, Prince Charles, in 1948. A daughter, Anne, was added to the family in 1950. It would be over a decade before Elizabeth gave birth to her youngest sons, Prince Edward, and Prince Andrew. As an interesting aside here, Elizabeth was serving as queen when Prince Edward and Prince Andrew were born, which makes her the first queen in England's history to give birth while holding the title. It was her husband, Philip, who had the difficult duty of passing the word to his wife that her father had passed. The two knew he was ill. In fact, they were traveling in Kenya because the king was not well enough to travel internationally, so his daughter and son-in-law took on the duty. The trip was supposed to include travel to Australia and New Zealand, but, of course, news of the king's death took priority over all else. Elizabeth, true to the stoic stereotype of the British and especially the royals, reportedly did not succumb to her emotions upon hearing the news but instead began planning the practical steps for what must come next. She and Philip, well, they returned to England, and it was on that plane flight home that she finally allowed herself to cry. Although, of course, she never did this in public. Even on that flight, she hid in the bathroom and emerged with reddened eyes, but a composed face. Years later, Elizabeth recalled the implications of taking the throne at such a young age. In a way, I didn't have an apprenticeship. My father died much too young. It's a question of maturing into something that one's got used to, and accepting the fact that here you are and it's your fate, because I think that continuity is very important. It is a job for life. Preparations for Elizabeth's coronation ceremony took over a year. Her father died in February of 1952, but the official coronation didn't occur until June of 1953. It did rain on the day of her coronation, but this did nothing to temper the excitement of the day for the British people who had watched this young woman grow up. Elizabeth was coronated in Westminster Abbey, bringing her into the line of kings and queens who had been crowned there for nearly a millennium. Not even 30 years old, Elizabeth solemnly delivered the coronation oath, which was heard by millions around the world. The ceremony, in a sign of the changing times, was the first British coronation ceremony to be televised. In her coronation speech, Elizabeth looked to the future, saying the following, I am sure that this, my coronation, is not the symbol of a power and a splendor that are gone, but a declaration of our hopes for the future. And for the years I may, by God's grace and mercy, 
be given to reign and serve you as your queen. Following the actual ceremony, Elizabeth and dozens of other dignitaries rode through the streets of London, cheered by adoring crowds. Still more applauding Brits stood and cheered her as she waved to them from the balcony of Buckingham Palace later in the evening. Elizabeth and Philip moved into Buckingham Palace after the coronation, but they did not spend much time there initially. Instead, they took off on a world tour for months of 1953 and 1954. The tour was the brainchild of Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who recognized the appeal of Queen Elizabeth to the masses and the possibilities such a favoured queen presented for building a positive image of England abroad. The royal couple they went around the world making Elizabeth the first European monarch to do so. She was also the first reigning British monarch to visit Australia, New Zealand and Fiji. This trip was only the first of many that Elizabeth would take as queen. During her 65 years and counting as queen, she has become the world's most widely travelled monarch. And by the way, as queen she does have an easier time than the rest of us because of the way British and international law works, which means that she doesn't actually need to have a passport. If she did have a passport, though, it would be plenty full. She has made nearly 300 foreign trips to 120 countries, including Canada and the United States, New Zealand, Australia, India, Bermuda, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Thailand, Brazil, and Russia. These are but a few of the countries she's visited. Some of the most notable trips she's taken include the opening of Canada's parliament, she's been the honorary at a ticker tape parade in New York City, and she's awarded the Mother Teresa Order of Merit in India, and she's also spoken at the United Nations. Traveling, it's been a large part of Queen Elizabeth's reign, but representing her nation abroad, well, that's not her only duty. As a monarch in a constitutional monarchy, she is tasked with many domestic duties. Though she does not get involved in politics, she must stay well informed of what is going on within her country and around the world. Each day, she receives piles of reading material encased in red metal boxes. The tradition of these red boxes dates back nearly two centuries, and until recently, members of parliament also received them. Parliament has actually recently opted to get digital versions of these documents, but the Queen remains tied to paper delivery, so those red boxes continue to arrive daily at her door. The material contained within encompasses everything from foreign intelligence to economic updates to the most mundane matters of state. Reading and digesting the information can take several hours a day, but it is a crucial part of her role as leader. Even today, at the age of 90, she receives her red box each day and takes the time to go through the crucial information contained within it. Queen Elizabeth's more public duties include presenting medals, issuing knighthoods, and presiding over many ceremonies that take place in a society that still has a queen. As she has aged, some of Elizabeth's duties have been passed down to her children and to her grandchildren, particularly ceremonies where the nobility receive their titles. Over the years, Elizabeth's family grew to include grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Her family, despite their royal blood, have not been immune from the ups and downs of life and love. Three of her four children have been through divorces with the world watching, and the death of Princess Diana shook the entire family, as well as the rest of the world. But it was in 1992 when much of the royal family seemed to crumble, with the marriages of Princess Anne, Prince Charles, and Prince Andrew all coming to their end in one way or another. It was also that year that Windsor Castle caught on fire and the public became outraged at the idea that their tax money would be used to rebuild it when the Queen was one of the richest women in the world. That year, though, the Queen demonstrated her political acumen when it was announced that the royal family would pay for the restoration of Windsor Castle and, in a reversal of a thousand-year-old policy, the family would begin paying their taxes. Queen Elizabeth, she has long understood the importance of public opinion. She's been the power behind the British monarchy's increased visibility in the media. She realized that the public wanted to know more about the family. They wanted to feel like they knew the royals. Increased transparency it was one way to help the royal family connect with the public, and it has long been a hallmark of Elizabeth's reign. Hers was the first televised coronation, and then she was the first to allow television cameras into Buckingham Palace. Live cameras were allowed into the palace during President Nixon's visit. An informal 
formal event that included lunch and the swapping of signed photographs between the world leaders. Elizabeth also welcomed cameras into the family's lives for the production of a documentary on the royals, hoping to show them as simply humans who loved their family members. But it wasn't until 2007 that Buckingham Palace really got with the times and launched an official YouTube channel. This was 10 years after perhaps one of the most important displays of Elizabeth's use of the media to effectively communicate with the public, her speech about Princess Diana. When Princess Diana died, amid the public mourning and the private grief of the family, Elizabeth broke protocol, recognizing that the country and the world needed to hear from the royal family. Princess Diana and the Queen, they were initially close, in fact, Diana even called her mama, but over time the relationship became, at best, strained. Diana regularly broke royal protocol and aired the dirty laundry of her and Charles's personal lives. The Queen, a stoic monarch from a rather different generation, did not understand and Diana's desire to be involved with AIDS charities or her willingness to talk publicly about the disintegration of her marriage. To this day, there are people like Diana's lover, Dodie Fired's father, who blame the Queen and the royal family for the car crash that killed Diana and his son. When Queen Elizabeth and her family did not immediately express their grief publicly, the press and the people of the world, well, they were pretty outraged. Eventually, though, Queen Elizabeth did give a live address speaking about Diana and the tragedy of her death. The Queen, she spoke of Diana in the way most of the world viewed her. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. While public opinion didn't immediately fully rebound in the Queen's favour, the address was helpful in stemming the tide of criticism. Unlike her children, Queen Elizabeth, she had a long marriage. She and Philip have the longest marriage of anyone in the royal family. 2017 actually marks their 70th wedding anniversary. Their major wedding anniversaries, they've long been celebrated in England, with their 25th being marked by a party that included other couples from around England who were also married on November the 20th, 1947. In 2007, the couple sentimentally returned to their honeymoon site in the Hampshire region of England. They, like any commoner couple might do, created their honeymoon photos. At their 50th anniversary, Queen Elizabeth, in what is regarded as an emotional expression for a member of the British monarchy, said this of her husband and her marriage. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt grat greater than he would ever claim, or we shall ever know. Queen Elizabeth's reign has also been punctuated by celebrations of milestones not just in her marriage, but also in the number of reigning years. Her Silver Jubilee, celebrating 25 years of her reign in 1977, was a nationwide party, marked by sporting events, carnivals, concerts, and general festivities. 25 years later, in 2002, her Golden Jubilee was just as merry of an affair, even though, unfortunately, both her mother and sister had died earlier in the year. To mark this occasion, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip traveled around the world. In June, a Jubilee weekend was held to mark the 50 years. One event called the Party at the Palace particularly stood out. Paul McCartney and Eric Clapton performed, and Brian May played a version of God Save the Queen. It was a raucous celebration filled with some of Britain's most recognizable celebrities, and it was watched all around the world. Thousands of people crowded London's parks and streets to see their favorite performers, sing along with their favorite songs, and most of all, to cheer for their queen.
Though stoic and dutiful, Queen Elizabeth II has set herself apart as a modern monarch. She is well known to be an animal lover, and her corgis are a recognizable part of the royal family, perhaps almost as much as its human members. During her reign, she has had over 30 corgis as pets, and they have even been involved in public affairs, such as the opening ceremonies for the London Olympics. The corgis, though, they haven't always been as cute and cuddly as they look. At one point, the royal family reportedly had to bring in an animal psychologist to help improve the dog's behavior when they started nipping at the many people who were around the royal residences. The queen herself was even injured once when she found herself in the midst of ten fighting corgis. These incidents, though, they did nothing to temper her love for animals, and the queen's corgis will forever be remembered as they are included with Elizabeth's image on such items as the Golden Jubilee commemorative coins. Apart from owning and pampering corgis, the queen has also shown herself to be an animal lover through her support of charities. Among the charities she supports are over four dozen that support animals in need. She is also generous in her donations to medical charities, giving to nearly 100 of them. She also donates money to her church. Interestingly, she takes this money to the church in her purse, making Sunday the only day of the week when she carries money. Overall, it is estimated that the Queen's charitable efforts have resulted in over $1 billion being donated to charity. Queen Elizabeth II, she has been in the public eye since childhood. Now, in her 90s and her 65th year as queen, she was a world leader for much of the 20th century and has helped usher in the 21st. Her reign has spanned that of 12 US presidents, 12 UK prime ministers, 7 popes, and 6 archbishops of Canterbury. She has replied to more than 3.5 million pieces of correspondence and received thousands of birthday greetings throughout her lifetime. She has met with leaders from all corners of the world and surpassed longevity records of both British and foreign monarchs. She is one of only five British monarchs who have ruled for more than 50 years, and in 2015 she became the longest reigning British monarch. Previously, that title had been held by Queen Victoria, Elizabeth's great-great-grandmother, who reigned for 63 years. Queen Elizabeth II, she's an icon of the 20th and 21st centuries, a strong female leader who retains a love of her people and a strong standing in the international community. She helped bring the monarchy into the modern world and remain stoic and dutiful through even the most trying of times. God save the Queen. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. We put out brand new videos twice a week. And as always, thank you for watching.